Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to War in the Pacific Admiral's Edition, our Let's Play series against Lieutenant Rainbow Slash. It is March 25th of 1942, and we're getting toward the tail end of the Japanese period where they get the amphibious bonus. Essentially, Japan gets a massive bonus for unloading cargo ships during the early part of the war, that helps to replicate the rapid Japanese advances uh, into the Pacific. Uh, however, uh, they have that bonus expire at the end of March, is my understanding. So in April, um, the Japanese will begin to uh, su suffer much slower unloading times, which has a pretty big impact on the ability to uh, rapidly advance anywhere, especially with resistance in their face. And so they've only got a couple days more of that. We are, we just witnessed one of our ships getting torpedoed here off the west coast. And uh, we're getting the turn started here. We've got a bunch of landings of Japanese troops all over the South Pacific. A lot of fast transport landings. And um, yeah, so that's what's going on so far. Most of these are already in areas where the Japanese already sort of have control on the surrounding seas, so we're not really losing anything by them taking these bases, but they are sort of solidifying their hold if they want to start building some of these dot bases up into, into something actually worthwhile. Moving into the air phase in the AM operations. Let's go ahead and fast forward this a little bit. Some recon occurring. A bunch of Japanese ships getting spotted in the Java Sea. We'll have to take a closer look at that. Meanwhile, Japanese Nell bombers are hitting our troops who retreated north of Moresby. So you can see he's using G3M Nells against our infantry formation that had been ejected from Moresby. Uh, we are trying to pull some of those troops out with transports uh, or with, um, with Catalinas, flying boats, flying in to rescue a couple hundred soldiers, bring them back to Australia. But he is bombing, uh, bombing these troops here north of, uh, north of Moresby. You can see another raid coming in here. Three more Nels. They're doing a fair bit of damage. These troops are really low on supply. They've got no uh, fortifications. He's got 17 Nels coming in as well. So he's he's deployed a fair number of his bombers to the New Guinea Rabaul area. If he's hitting them with 17 Lilies and also Nels, that means he's got at least one squadron of each of those. Uh, meanwhile, an SB-3 raid here in China. Our nine SB-3s hitting his troops that are moving toward Quilin. Another raid of six coming in. A lot of people say, oh, you gotta be careful about your air power in China. You'll burn through too much supply. And while that's true, our supply in China has gone up by like 60,000 because of the Rangoon uh, flush of supplies. And so uh, I feel a little more comfortable using a little bit of air power in China just because of that. I'm kind of surprised that uh, he didn't uh, he didn't throw any cap up um, over those troops because we bombed him last turn as well. Okay, we'll have to see. There's a bunch of shipping in the Java Sea now, so it might make sense to unleash our uh, our twin engine bombers, even though they're probably not going to be very effective. Meanwhile, 23 KI-51 Sonyas dropping some bombs here to the west of Manila at Batan on our troops there. Three of them were damaged by flak. One runway hit. No damage done to the troops. Another 16 Sonyas coming in here. So he's got a lot of his sort of second line dive bombers here. Sonyas, uh, one destroyed, one more damaged. History of the Great War. Thanks for the sub, sir. That's seven months. Appreciate it. And another raid of Sonys coming in here. Another one destroyed by Flak. Pretty good day for the Flak Gunners of Batan. Okay. I am the Allies, uh, Big Mac, not Japan. Okay, so it looks like a, v a squadron combined in Cairns. Some damage control occurring here. I think that's about it for the turn. Let's see if there's any land combat. Oh, I forgot to turn off my bombardment it at Batan. So you can see he's got two divisions here of about 450 and 436 in terms of their AV assault value. 
So that brings him just shy of a total of 900. The bombardment's doing a fair bit of damage there. You can see the 16th division's ticking down a bit, down to 444. The other one's at about 430. So they're closer to about 8, 880 now in terms of their assault value. Um, we had only a small bombardment force, uh, or we didn't set all of our units to that, but we inflicted 172 casualties, 16 squads disabled. A pretty effective bombardment there for our, for our boys. Meanwhile, Japanese delivered attack at Goodnow Island. It doesn't keep track of individual am well, it does keep track of individual ammo types, like, but it's kind of aggregated, so like, you know, you might have like a value of 4 for your 16-inch guns on your battleship and you can consume that ammunition um, in battle, but it's not keeping like individual round counts for for the ship. It's 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 averaging that out to some some level. It also does restrict where you can reload so submarines can't reload their torpedoes at like a really really tiny backwater port unless there's a submarine tender there in which case the submarine tender will will refill them using the supply in the tender likewise you can there's there are ships called akes and and, and aes i think which are like ammunition ships which can either do underway replenishment of ammunition for certain types of ships and weapons or or um in port Yeah, it doesn't differentiate ammo types, Lake, so you definitely will use up your naval ammo by bombarding. Okay, so... Let's see here. Current state of things in the playthrough history. That's a fair request. It's been a while since I've done it, I think, on YouTube. Uh, it is March of 19... Uh, March 26, 1942. Uh, the Japanese have advanced far more in certain places than historical. They've already taken Midway, for example. Uh, they have also taken Canton Island. They had taken Baker Island, but we actually retook that. It was very lightly held, so a Marine Defense Battalion was able to retake that. They've pushed way further south toward... Uh, Vadopu and Funafuti and they're threatening Fiji or, or uh, Suva as well as Pago Pago and the Samoa Islands. They've also taken Savi in the Samoa Islands. Um, they've taken New Caledonia off the Australian coast as well as Espirito Santos, Guadalcanal, the entire Solomons. They also just recently took Port Moresby. We're trying to evacuate the troops in Port Moresby via air uh, with what we can, but we're definitely not going to get them all out. So those are all areas where Japan is way ahead of schedule. Uh, they have taken Timor on the northern coast of Australia or to the north of Australia's coast. This is all historical conquests, roughly in line with when they should. Our troops are still holding out at Ambon. We are trying to pull some Australian troops out of uh, Kolak. Uh, there's a, a good Australian battalion of infantry, the Gull Battalion here, that we're trying to pull out via sort of float planes and bring them back into, uh, into Java. Uh, where currently we have not yet been attacked. Um, he has taken Palembang, and he's in the process of reducing the island of Sumatra, but he's got a lot of ground to cover there. Singapore fell really late. Singapore didn't fall till like mid-March, um, a little bit less than a week ago, I believe. So the fall of Singapore is a big deal, but it was delayed by over a month from the historical date, which really put some other things behind schedule, I think. Kuching on the northern coast of, Borne oh, coast of Borneo hasn't fallen yet, but everything else pretty much in this area has. Uh, meanwhile, there's been no push into Burma yet, no indication of a push there. Uh, the bulk of what I think the bulk of the Royal Thai Army is sitting at Mulman, uh, but we have no indication of any large numbers of troops at Chiang Mai uh, or any position to drive into the heart of Burma. So for the moment, Burma is relatively quiet. We have poured a ton of supplies like three, four, five hundred thousand supplies into Rangoon. The logic for that is that that when you have a huge amount of supply sitting here, we've set our, our bases up to China so that they draw this supply very slowly into China over the Burma Road. So the game gives you like 200 supply or maybe it's 2,000 supply a day in China for the Burma Road. But we're supplementing that with another couple hundred that are being transferred via these bases inefficiently, but being transferred nonetheless over into China. As a result, the total supply value in China has gone up by over 60,000, which is pretty impressive. 
We've been driven back from uh, Sigaton, Changtha, and uh, Changsha here in central China, but we've reformed a new defensive line here uh, near uh, Chikikang, which is we're holding a pretty strong line behind a river here in good defensive terrain, and the enemy is showing no indication of wanting to advance in this direction. They have started advancing in the south of China again toward Quilin. We can see these seven enemy units have arrived at Quilin, uh, but we do have some troops in this theater as well that are currently sitting here, about 1,800 assault value. Not sure how strong his troops are here, probably about on par, uh, but our troops are sitting here in Quilin, um, and they are uh, hopefully going to hold the base. We have a level 3 fort there, so that should help. Um, the terrain there is... Uh, times two defensive. It's wooded terrain. So I believe WD, I believe that translates to wooded terrain, which is a times two defense, or I guess it's forest, but it's still times two defense, plus the three forts. Um, meanwhile, the real big update this turn that uh, I haven't gotten to, to show you guys yet, but he is making a massive flanking maneuver at, in the north of China at Cyan. So Cyan is obviously a key Chinese base. We've stymied his uh, advance in the south here by putting several cores in mountainous terrain south of Cyan. Uh, they put in a couple of units here, but there, there appears to be no real indication that they're going to be able to hurt us there. Um, but if we actually take a look, there is uh, a large enemy formation on the railway east of Cyan. That is, is a problem here. Right now he's put one unit adjacent of one of our cores, the 76th Corps, which is currently sitting in WR terrain. WR terrain is... Uh, forest and rough, so it's a times three defensive hex. That's a very good defensive hex. So even if he has a full division here, we've probably got a reasonable shot of holding out here because we've got over 300 assault value on the defensive in good terrain. The problem is he's got more troops on the way coming to the left here. And then it looks like if we hover over here, he's got 28 units here to the west of Taiyun. Some of those units are moving east. Some of those units are moving west. I don't know how many are moving each direction, but we can see there's a little dot in each direction on this icon. It looks like there's a bigger dot moving left, so I'm assuming a large number of those troops are moving left, which makes me think he's in the process of making a flanking maneuver on Cyan, which is one of the really important bases in northern China. Uh, the reason it would make sense for him to do this is a couple of reasons. If we look, there's a clear roadway. These red lines represent roads, so there's a clear roadway directly into Cyan along the flank. The bulk of our troops are deployed to the south. We do have these troops here in good defensive terrain, times three defensive terrain, but if he breaks through this one unit here, the next hex has times two defensive terrain. It's rough terrain. The two other hexes beyond that are clear terrain. Chinese forces fighting in clear terrain against Japanese troops of equal or less size get rocked. Japanese artillery just obliterates. Japanese armor obliterates, and it really does put us in, in a rough spot. Um, however, with that being said, um, the, the uh, Japanese also would then be able to move in and attack Cyan itself, which is another clear terrain. Now, Cyan does have three forts. We're building up a fourth, so that will help, but clear terrain is never, never where you want to fight the Japanese in China. And so it does pose the question of whether we need to start withdrawing north into the mountains to the north of Cyan. If we pull our troops into this rough and mountainous terrain up here, if we get them into this mountainous hex or, or these mountainous hexes up near Kuching, uh, that will give us a huge advantage on the defensive. Mountain trains are times three in terms of defensive value. They also have a huge supply cost. So the Japanese units are, are more difficult to supply. Uh, and so that would that would hurt them, presumably, because of all their equipment and things like that. Now, withdrawing that far north does pose one problem in that, in theory, he could then use this this very poor road to push west uh, toward King Kao, and then he could flank and take Chongqing from the rear. He'd have to move through very difficult mountainous terrain to get there, or rough terrain to get there, but it is an option. Again, it, it's a the in theory, it is an option that he could, uh, he could uh, pursue. Um, so that's the situation in China. That's the big update in China. The other big update that I did want to talk about in this turn is it does appear that the Japanese are withdrawing one of their units, or maybe both of their units, out of Bataan. So we still have the, Brit the, the, um, the American forces and the Filipino forces in Bataan. Uh, they have not been really hurt at all. They still have completely full supply. Their supply is starting to run low. You can see a full resupply for this entire force would take 7,900 supply. They've got 9,700. So... I think that means they've got like a week of supply, basically, before they're going to 
start running short, probably about two weeks, I would guess, before you start seeing these units in the red and really starting to suffer. Now, this poses the question. If the Japanese are really pulling out, they have two divisions here for about 800 assault value, 850 assault value. We have uh, 1,900 assault value for all of our troops. Most of our troops are Filipino infantry divisions, which are not as good in this game as allied infantry or as, uh, as American infantry units. They don't have enough heavy equipment. They've got a fair number of rifle squads, but they don't have enough heavy equipment. We do have the 4th Marine Regiment, which is a very good regiment. Uh, and then I think we've got the 31st Infantry Regiment, which is another U.S. regiment. Uh, and then I think we've got some uh, uh, tanks somewhere uh, in here. Um, do we have armor? We do. We have the 192nd Armored uh, Battalion, which has M3 Stuart Light Tanks, 59 of them. So that would do pretty well against the Japanese in an attack. The thing is, if we attack, we're going to burn up supply at a much more prodigious rate. However, these guys are dead anyway. Eventually, they're going to die. They're stuck in a really bad spot. Batan is a jungle hex, so a jungle hex is a times three defensive hex. So that does, or actually, it's a times two defensive hex, not three. So that's good. Um, likewise, apparently, Clark Field is JR, which I think is times three. I think it's jungle and forest or jungle and rough. Yeah. So if they do pull back, we're pretty much not going to have any chance because you go from a times two to a times three modifier, and the Japanese superiority means we'd never be able to really push them out. But if we attack them now, we might be able to so badly maul them that if we follow them up to Clark Field, then perhaps we would have a chance of driving them out of Clark Field. And who knows? I don't know what units he has in Manila, but if he's got 10 units there, but I don't know what. Um... If they're mostly like base forces or aviation forces or construction forces, we might actually have a chance to retake Manila. Um, so we'll have to see what that what that looks like. But that is something we could look into. Um, you know, this is uh, a really unique opportunity. I think when XTRG was in charge, he probably didn't bring enough troops to Bataan to reduce the, the location. If we attack now, we could shorten the defense of Bataan by two or three weeks if we if we fail bad and allow the Japanese a counterattack. But this is really the only chance we've got to give the Japanese a bloody nose in the Philippines beyond the defensive successes we've had so far in the south in Kagan on Mindanao, where our troops are now in really bad shape. I don't know if he knows that yet, but the uh, XTRG had attacked multiple times down here, failed multiple times. We wrecked several enemy infantry regiments. We're holding these guys in place for the moment. But our troops are going to starve out there very soon, uh, the only thing is that uh, we do have, potentially, a chance to wreck two Japanese divisions. And if we attack very successfully, we could ruin two Japanese divisions uh, for some time, and that would probably be worth it. And, you know, maybe it would force him to divert troops to the Philippines that were bound for somewhere else. So we could consider a shock attack, uh, which has... The potential to wreck two divisions instantly in one attack, but also has the potential to wreck my own force. It's it's a highly v uh, volatile attack. Um, or we could do a deliberate attack, which would be less risky, but is more likely just to kind of shove the Japanese troops out of the way without doing much more than maybe destroying 20 or 30 or 40, maybe 50 squads. But it's not likely to, cha to hurt the Japanese bad enough, even if we win, to allow us to follow them up to Clark Field. So I'm... I'm I'm erring on the side of, you know what, let's fuck it, let's go for it. Let's just launch a shock attack in Bataan and see if we can accomplish something. It's almost April of 42 anyway. We're supposed to be surrendering very soon anyway if we're following like the historical timeline. So we might as well get something out of it, right? Uh, if we take a look here, we can see that the uh, one of the other things to keep in mind is that the USAA or the USAFFE uh, headquarters is located here with General Douglas MacArthur still in charge. It has a hundred a uh, hundred prep points for um, for Bataan, as well as all of the other headquarters units in the Philippines. What that does is when you have your headquarters in the same hex or in range, and you have the theater headquarters as well, which is the USA FFE. This is sort of the 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 parent headquarters for all of the headquarters in the hex. You can get like a one hundred percent bonus on your attack value. So you can get a much better attack in Bataan because these headquarters units are all in the hex and they all have their, their, their prep points up to 100. Um, and almost all of our infantry troops do as well. There's a couple of individual units that don't, but almost everybody else does. 
So, you know, the best case scenario to me is we attack two Japanese divisions, we wreck them. We follow them up to Clark Field, wreck what's left, advance on Manila, wreck that, take the industry, take the supply that allows us to hold out in the Philippines for longer and forces him to divert more troops to the Philippines uh, in order to, you know, take it as he needs to. That seems like a little bit absurd. Like, is that really going to happen? Probably not. But it does, it does, you know, that's best case scenario. Moderate best case is we just drive him back, but we can't follow up. Or, you know, he has more troops in Manila than we thought. But I think it's worth it. I think it's worth a go. I think it's worth a try. So I think what we will do is we will launch a shock attack here uh, in this hex. It's going to consume a lot of supply, but the hope is that we just completely destroy him. Or, I mean, maybe not completely, but we, we give him a real big bloody nose uh, and uh, do some damage to him. Meanwhile, uh, the f uh, what else is going on? The other big thing that we saw this turn is there's a whole bunch of Japanese uh, naval vessels in the Java Sea. Uh, it looks like there's a destroyer. There's five ships here moving west, so moving toward the Java coast. There are uh, another nine ships spotted north here with one heavy cruiser, perhaps. There's also three small, three other task forces, which this one might be like a fast transport task force, this APD task force. Um and this could be like a carrier task force uh, down here. This could be like the mini Kitty Butai or whatnot, because it looks like there's 100 fighters and 77 bombers. So this may be his initial effort to maybe get a small beachhead in Java uh, to to kind of start reducing the island. I made a mistake, guys. I built my entire defensive strategy around holding Batavia, not thinking. What this does is, this is a good base, it's a good hex, it's a good place to hold. If we take a look here, it is a UI, which is a light industry town, uh, which gives us a times two defense. It also produces its own supply, because it has factories and stuff like that here. So it's got light industry, heavy industry, and, and resources. So it produces its own supply. But the problem is, it's on a coastal hex. So he could definitely bring in battleships and things like that, to completely overwhelm our defenses and bombard these troops into dust. So that was a mistake. We've got a lot of assault value here, almost a thousand that's just kind of hanging out here, but it's very vulnerable to enemy bombardment. Now, what we could do is we could move these troops into a mountain hex that's not on the coast, right? Like uh, Bandong is, is perhaps a better place to shift all of our stuff. We actually already have level three fortifications, so maybe that would make sense. If we put our men in strat mode and move them to Bangdong, that might not be a terrible idea. Although if he starts the air raids on us, it could be, it could be a little bit too late. Also, the other, the other problem is, oh, no, it's a level 3 air capacity too. So we could hold out there potentially for a while. It, again, it is a mountainous hex. I don't know if I can get all my troops there fast enough, but it is, it is an option. Um, so pretty sure the Japanese have the mini carrier, uh, task force given it's a CVL that's reported as well as CSs. So CSs are like float plane tenders and CVLs are light carriers. So this is probably the mini Kidubutai moving in. Um, so that's the other thing is we'd risk putting our troops into strat mode and being ex exposed to enemy air attack, but I think it might be worth it. The only bad thing is all of these guys are set to prep for Batavia. Some of them are at a hundred percent, including the army headquarters. So we're not going to get any like AV bonuses because we're going to have to switch these guys over to a new base. Um, but hopefully we could pull these 60,000 supplies with them and hold out for quite some, quite some time. We could try and swarm them with subs. We do have quite a few subs in the area. So I do plan to get active with my subs. Uh, we do also have some patrol boats that are based out of Semarang. Um, so we've got a couple of patrol boat task forces here. We were repairing some of these guys in the port as well. Um, and it looks like these guys all completed their repairs. So we have these guys in repair. They're all completed and back to 100% readiness. So we can try and send some, uh, some PT boats out at them uh, with, uh, with aggressive intent and see if we can't maybe get, uh, get a little bit lucky. Uh, how are naval searches? Well, I mean, I think the naval search in jo the Java Sea is going reasonably well, given we spotted all of these task forces. It's, it's, it's doing something. So um, that's, that's something to consider. Do I have any warships in the area? I pulled all my warships back. Perhaps the one exception are now these very, very vulnerable. This one tanker here that we moved to Tijilap to try and sneak out a little bit more oil uh, is currently worth 15 points. Its speed is 12 knots. 
and it is sitting in port at Tijlap. It is behind partial cloud cover, and it has not been detected by the Japanese yet. It's loaded 2,000 fuel out of Tijlap. Again, we were trying to pull more fuel out of the Dutch East Indies without their, uh, without their knowledge. So perhaps we need, to, we need to pull it back further. Also, there's always the risk that he's going to sprint these carriers through past Oosthaven and try and raid our, uh, our supply situation here out uh, to the west of Java. That could be something to be concerned about. We are unloading some troops, by the way, at Coast Coast Islands, uh, the second uh, AIF Pioneer troops. So we are un in the process of getting these guys down uh, to hold this atoll with a little bit more. Actually, it's not an atoll, is it? It's a full-blown base. There's no stack limits. Well, there's a 30,000-man stack limit. But in any event, I'm trying to get some Australian troops here ashore. So you can see these. Uh, we've got... Actually, this is a pretty damn good unit. I didn't realize it was quite this good. These guys might be kind of stranded here for a while, but it's we've got over 40 assault value on this thing. So uh, so that's good. Are they two different Pioneer Battalions? The second first Pioneer Battalion and the second second? Yeah, so maybe we run the tanker south and just try and get away. Where did you stuff all the Abda ships? Um, some of them are, are escaped down to, to Australia. So we've got, I think we have some of their cruisers down here, right? Mm, or did I pull them back to Colombo? I honestly can't remember where we put them. Very few of our uh, Abdicom ships got sunk. Oh, by the way, we have three battleships at Colombo now. But I honestly can't remember where the Abda, Abda ships went. Um... Let's see here. We did lose like two of them in battles around uh, around Malaya. So if we if we take a look at the cruiser sunk, we lost the British light cruiser Ceres, the British light cruiser Dragon. Um, we also lost the Java, the Dutch cruiser Java, and the American cruiser Houston in battles off Mersing. The Japanese lost the light cruiser Katori off the coast of Mersing. Um, and they also lost the Kashima and the, uh, the Kashima near Bilip Islands. Um, so there's that. We also sank the Haruna. We know that. These two I don't think sank the Congo and the Fuso. I think that's fog of war. So that's the situation right now. Um, we have some troops that are kind of holding out to the north of Mulman. We've got the 46th Indian Brigade, the 1st Burma Division, and the 18th British Infantry Division. From what I understand, the Burma troops are kind of worthless in-game, but the British troops are okay. Um, we may want to pull the BFF Brigade back. I've been kind of trying to get it rested and replenished here. Uh, it's up to 50 dis, uh, disgruntled units, but again, it's primarily a Burmese force, so apparently they're not very... Not very effective. Uh, we could pull them back, perhaps, as, to act as garrison. We do also have the 17th Indian Division, uh, which has Indian and British troops located in it. It currently has a fair amount of disruption as well. We're trying to get that down a bit. Um, so we've got about 426 at Pegu in terms of combat power. We've got about 901 south of Pegu, so that gives us about 1,300. And then Rangoon has another 144. We also have the seventh, uh, the seventh Australian Infantry Division on the way into Rangoon, which is a bit of a risk because the Japanese could attempt to sink it at sea with like G3Ms and Nels and stuff. There's no indication that they've spotted these guys yet. There's been no detection on this force, so that's good for us. The seventh Australian is a crack division out of the desert. 61 experience, 90 plus morale. These guys are an elite unit here that are on the way. Some of their equipment got left behind at Colombo, but I am in the process of, of getting it out. It's just support equipment though um, the Japanese have also landed troops at Port Blair you can see here but they are uh, paratroopers and they don't have sufficient troops to take the base at the moment um, I've considered with these three battleships of Colombo sprinting into Blair and trying to bombard it not sure how many bombers and things like that he might have in the theater we know he's got aircraft at Chiang Mai. we know he's got uh, quite a bit of aircraft at Bangkok but we haven't seen any indication of his bomber force there we do have pretty good fighters at, uh, at Rangoon itself. So you can see here, if we check out the base, we've got 99 fighters that are ready. We did uh, get rid of two hurricane squadrons that were about to be withdrawn. So we, we were managed to salvage their planes uh, and then re-equip some other squadrons with their aircraft. Um, there was a squadron of buffaloes somewhere. There's also some hurricanes at Pegu. 
Um, and then at Lachau, not sure where that other, the squadron that had been Buffalo's is located now. I think they're railing right now. They were at Chittagong, and I think they're railing Delito. <clears throat> I can't remember where I put them. I also do have some reinforcements that are on their way south from Akiab. So we've got the 7th British Armored Brigade, which consists of over 100 Stuart One Light tanks. So those boys will be really effective against the Japanese, but they're a bit of a march away. So we're trying to bring them down via the coastal road, which is the fastest way to go. If the Japanese attack in the next few days, obviously they're out of the fight. There's no way to sort of save them there. But, um, but there's also a good chance that they get there because we haven't seen any indication of the Japanese being ready to move in Burma anytime soon. Lar 10201966, thanks for the follow. And O2PI, thank you for the follow. So yeah, um, meanwhile, let's see. I don't think there's a lot else to show. We do have our carriers south of Australia at the moment. They are moving to the west coast, uh, just sort of chilling out there. We also have uh, loaded up a replenishment task force at Perth. It has 16,000 fuel. It'll meet up with the tankers at Esperance, well south of any likely Japanese uh, submarine locations. We're using Perth as our primary supply point, bringing supplies into Australia from the uh, South Africa. From South Africa, we've got 25,000 more fuel on the way from Colombo there. We've got 24,000 fuel coming in on these tankers here. Uh, actually, cargo ships, I suppose. Uh, we've got uh, 384 aircraft about to arrive in Perth. Uh, two squadrons here of RAF groups. It looks like 16 Hurricanes and 12 Fulmers. So uh, 18 aircraft total, a 300 value of air, air weight. Um, and then we've got 420 air weight coming in on here. So this is a field artillery unit, the Australian Corps, an Australian Corps, the 11th RAF squadron of 14 Blenheims, um, RAF Group 222, uh, which is a badly needed base force that supplies like aviation support and things like that. Um, and that's kind of heading into Perth as well, trying to buttress up Australia a little bit. Um, while we're also sort of trying to protect Australia's supply lines by putting these troops into the Coast Coast Islands uh, to hold that base. Alchemist 00, or OO, thank you for the follow. Um, these tankers are returning, another 40,000 on the way into Perth here. Eh, we'll see, Co. I'm not going to throw everything that I have into Burma. I'm not strong in Australia at all, Co. I have a lot of ground forces, but I have next to no air forces in in Australia. I've got sixteen hurricane. Er, I've got sixteen hurricanes at Brisbane, uh, sixteen Kitty Hawks here. I think I've got like three or four other Kitty Hawk squadrons of P40s on the east coast. But now that the Japanese have Moresby, they can start launching bombing raids on the northern Australian coast if they want. Likewise, they could, in theory. Uh, bomb Brisbane out of Nomaya. That's within range of their threes or, or Nels with just bombs. So we need aviation support. Now that would be risky because they'd be out of the range of zeros. But if I don't have any fighters there to shoot them down, I'm not sure how, how much it matters. I've got to have some fighters in Australia. Um, okay. I am bringing the Hermes into the South Pacific here. Uh, the intention... <clears throat> is to pull some of these marine groups on Fiji. So we'll probably pull one of these F4, F3 squadrons out of Fiji, throw it on the Hermes, and then swing it back to join the carrier floats, or float fleet, uh, and uh, maybe upgrade or, or increase the air wing of my, uh, my carriers there by another marine fighter squadron. Uh, we really missed a trick with not reinforce Nomaya with the cruisers when we could. Uh, I don't know what that means, Sean Mack. Um, but yeah, that's the situation right now. Our battleships, I think, are heading toward Tahiti at the... Or no, no, I, re I diverted them. Our battleships are south of Pago at the moment. So our battleships are on the way to Vavu. Uh, a whole bunch of them, too. We've got six battleships because Pearl Harbor didn't really do anything. His, uh, his raid of Pearl Harbor lost 40 zeros trying to strafe at 100 feet. Bit of a, bit of a rookie mistake there for XTRG, unfortunately for him. Uh, and as a result, our battleships, we didn't lose a, we have not lost a single battleship in this war so far. The California and the Tennessee are both going to be out a little bit less than a year still on repairs. The Oklahoma will be ready in three days. <clears throat> in San Diego, we've got one battleship. The Pennsylvania will be ready in five months. Um, so that's three battleships that he very badly damaged at Pearl. 
The Arizona and the Maryland will both be ready inside of a little bit over a month. The Maryland tomorrow, actually. So really only three badly, badly damaged battleships. The, the West Virginia is three months away. Um, so we're, we're basically looking at having all but three battleships returned to our fleet by uh, June. And um, while in theory that sounds like three battleships missing, that's a lot. We didn't even lose the Prince of Wales or the Repulse. We fought off the coast of Malaya, but we didn't do the stupid suicidal run into enemy bombers. And as a result, the Repulse will be ready in about 43 days. The Prince of Wales is still going to be gone for a while. But the fact that none of these sank, that's like a division worth of or more worth of victory points that we didn't lose on any of those engagements. If we go and take a look at today, it looks like we lost six aircraft. The Japanese lost four. Two of those aircraft were Sonia's on the Japanese side, two Catalina's on our side, one Teresa, one Zero, one Hudson, one uh, 139WH3, one Hudson 3A, and one DC-2. Uh, if we take a look at pilot losses, not that. If we take a look at uh, pilot losses, two of our pilots were KIA. Was Brownwall dead? I can't remember that, but I can't remember if he was dead or not. But you can see here, a couple of our aces are dead. We've got a good number of aces, though. Leading ace is still T. Cole, who unfortunately was lost. B.D. Wagner, who was one of our other top aces, is in the pilot training pool. We pulled him out of the front line, uh, so he is training groups. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of the guys are all still forward deployed. Um, if we take a look here, ship availability, what do we have coming up? Looks like we've got an AMC Minesweeper in four days, the Submarine Drum o Fleet Oiler Cimarron, uh, the Corvette Dunadas uh, in six days, the J. Franklin Bell in seven days, the Pakenham in eight days, as well as the Cape Alvia in Cairo City, uh, a tanker in nine days. Nothing really substantial. A couple destroyers, but the next substantial reinforcement of ships is the heavy cruiser Devonshire in 20 and the light cruiser uh, Atlanta in 20. Also, several submarines come on that day. Several troop transports come in on that day. Uh, and then just shortly after that, the British carrier Illustrious comes online, just a little bit over a month away uh, as well. If we also go and we take a look at... What else am I going to look at here? Um, ground reinforcements. Uh, we have some big reinforcements coming very soon. So not the Middlesex Battalion here, but if we take a look, we've got the... 9th U.S. Marine Regiment uh, coming in six days in San Diego. Um, I've been toying around with the idea of using an a, a initial sort of surprise counter-invasion of Midway, perhaps using some Marines there uh, to try out an amphibious strike uh, maybe in a month or so. Um, the Marines would be a good-sized unit given that it's an atoll to not get themselves savaged too hard. We have the 70th, 70th British Division will be arriving in India uh, in six days, but it's only 50 uh, AV and it's locked to operating within India. And then we have three British Infantry Brigades, the 23rd, 16th, and 14th, which will all be arriving in the Middle East and we can throw on transports. They're 80 experienced units. These guys are crack troops all arriving in Aden as well as the 45th Recon Regiment. So this is basically a crack British division. For whatever reason, they don't link together as a division as far as I can tell. But uh, that'll be a crack British division here, a total of about 400 assault value arriving in the Middle East in six days, as well as the 26th Indian Division, which will also be arriving in six days. So we're going to be getting uh, on the order of 750 very good assault value uh, arriving in, uh, in the Middle East uh, or India in the next week. And we can, we can push those guys for it as well. Uh, so we can uh, so we can strengthen India. So like my plan is to defend in Burma, but I realize that a forward defense of Burma is very risky, and so we will likely lose there eventually. And so that means we can't let India be this empty shell that the Japanese can push into and get a ton of victory points. So my plan is to use those 400 assault value that we're going to be getting back to reinforce Sri Lanka and to reinforce India itself to ensure that he can't quickly follow up uh, and attack. He, he'd be, it'd be very difficult from a supply perspective to do so, but if we don't have troops in place to stop them, we can't. So that's what those troops are going to be used for in conjunction with the troops we already have in India right now. Uh, meanwhile, what's our political point situation look like? 1553, there's one division I did want to try and unlock. Uh, I need to find where those, where that was. Let's take a look here. Is it the 40th? I don't think it's the 40th. No, they're 2300 because they're, they're a bigger division. Uh, 27th? 
Yeah, so the 27th, in theory, if we don't spend any political points this turn, we will get 50 more points at the end of this turn, and then we will have enough to unlock the 27th Infantry Division, so unrestrict its headquarter, so we can move this division off the U.S. West Coast. It's currently set to not take replacements. That's what you want to do when you're playing this game. You don't want U.S. West Coast forces to have replacements on. The reason is if your replacements are on, they'll suck up all your troops in your pool so that you don't have replacements for your troops in your forward positions. But equally as bad, as these units get larger, it becomes more politically difficult for you to unlock them for use where you want. So a uh, locked division, for example, with 200 infantry squads is 1,500 points for you to go ahead and unlock. Whereas the other unit that we had just looked at, the 47th, infantry division here or the 40th infantry division has 273 squads so they have 73 more squads some more other equipment and they will cost 2300 to unlock so we definitely don't want to do that their replacements are fuck so apparently their replacements were on which is probably why this unit got built up toward its toe uh, and was was more expensive i, I really I'm a little bit annoyed at myself that I did that because you only get 50 political points a day. So your replacements should pretty much always be off on any U.S. West Coast units unless they're already unrestricted and you're trying to get them ready to head out to head out to, to combat. What's the plan for all that assault value? Um, where? In India? The plan with the British units is to... Um, bring in maybe a brigade into Sri Lanka to reinforce the position there, maybe two brigades. Put the other units into India so that when we lose in Burma and the troops that do retreat are kind of a uh, bombed-out hulk, we've got other units to sort of plug the gap and defend India against a Japanese advance. We also did move one Australian division to Australia, so that should help defend Australia in the event that he tries to make the jump across from uh, Port Moresby to Oz. So that's something else that we, we look at. Uh, let's take a little, I don't, what did I click? I didn't mean to click that. Uh, anything else? We kind of looked at everything else on here. Uh, political points right now, 1,200 for the Japanese, 9,000 for the Allies. If the Japanese have three times the Allied political point score at the end of 20, uh, 1942, then they get an auto victory. So essentially he would need 27,000 victory points uh, to get there. Um, meanwhile, at the end of 42, they need double the victory points to get there. So there's sort of a sliding scale of victory in the game. Uh, if we take a look at our pools, let's see here. Let's look at our... Oh, by the way, one other thing that you may or may not have seen if you haven't been around in a while. We did uh, sort of get rid of a bunch of squadrons on the U.S. West Coast that had P-38 Lightnings but were restricted there. Replaced them with like crappy planes like the Mohawk. And now we have 27 P-38 Lightnings currently in Mandalay. We're in the process of trying to get them... Maybe I should turn their training off. I don't want them to be taking any, any damage to the airframes. So I know we're training the pilots right now, but that seems like a little bit of a waste if it ends up causing the planes to get knocked out from maintenance. I really need to try and get these guys up and running as quick as possible. It's an elite squadron. It's a flying tiger squadron actually that's been outfitted with the first p-38s in the field uh and uh our hope is to give uh give rainbow a little bit of a, a surprise once he starts his attack in rangoon my plan is to use those p-38s move him forward fly a sweep over one of his bases where he's basing the the bombers out of maybe it's chiang mai maybe it's bangkok and then uh, it can I even reach bangkok probably from pegu right nine nine hexes what's the range on the 38 Seven. Uh, damn. Well, I can't reach rank. I can't can't fly a sweep over Rangoon, but or Bangkok. But I'm sure he will bring some of his other uh, his other air units forward here again. We know he's got air units at Chiang Mai. So fly a sweep over there, and then we also have some B-17s which we've deployed here. So we've got uh, if we hide that, we've got 21 B-17s currently sitting in Burma. Most of them are ready for combat at the moment, um, and we'll we'll go ahead and uh, and bomb them. Oh, it's times four for 42 and three for 43? I thought it was three and two, but whatever. Um, in any event, we've got uh, we've got 21 B-17s that were in the process of, uh, of, of uh, getting ready to launch some bombing strikes. We also do have another seven B-17s back at Lido that had been flying over the hump uh, toward, um, toward China to bring supplies in. Uh, but the, the plan for these guys is to uh, bring them down to Ma Mandalay as well so that we can um, uh, increase our bomber force closer to, to 30 B-17s. And we have a couple of B-17s which are sort of uh, lollygagging it on the way over there toward, toward Burma. They're currently sitting back repairing at Tijilap, repairing at uh, Dojakarta, 
uh, and repairing at, uh, there's one more base where they're at, Denzipur? Yeah. So we've got, you know, one at Denzipur, one at Dojakarta, and then we've got two at Tijalap. So that's four more B-17s we could bring forward. So we could have, in theory, if everybody was flying, a rate of 30 or so fortresses trying to hit Japanese airfields, which could do quite a bit of damage if we're able to get rid of the fighter cover and make those bombers more effective. We do need to consider what these enemy, enemy ships are doing here. So we have 27 Dutch bombers located at Batavia or in and around Batavia. So we've got uh, nine B-25 Mitchells here. We have uh, nine uh, A-20 Bostons. Uh, and so the, the pilots aren't very well trained, but I'm kind of considering bringing these guys in on a low-level strike at this enemy shipping to see if we can't do some damage here. Because this is, this is you know, if the enemy gets ashore, then it game's over. So we might as well try and sink some shipping at sea. Now, they're probably flying cap over, over some of these guys with the, uh, with the mini Kirubutai, but hopefully two engine bombers coming in on the deck might get in under their cap or... Um, at least they're two engine bombers so they can take some some damage there I don't really have any way to run away from from Java like Kojima and I have no ability to transport these troops out they're all pretty much locked into position so the only thing I can really pull out is the air power um, and and we could we can't really pull out the Dutch air power because it's locked to the bases so I can't withdraw those guys I've got a couple of American Catalinas that are located here that we can transfer out but their range is so long that I can pull them out at any time uh, once I'm ready. Yeah, the bombers always get through. Damn straight, Ko. Or, like a G-Man. Or, Lake. Oh my god, I'm I'm seeing him. Uh. Um, unloading some fuel in Australia. So, there's that. Yeah, they always get through somewhere. Um, what are these guys unloading? I think they're anti-aircraft guns. Yeah, we'll bring in Pago some some AA, some ACAC. Meanwhile, we've brought a uh, replenishment, uh, an, an auxiliary ammunition replenishment vessel, the Pyro. What a great name for a ship that carries like 16-inch <laughs> shells or whatever, uh, into Vavu to help uh, support the battleships that are moving in that direction. What's the title of this video, Charcoal? Um, I don't know. What should the title of this video be? It was a pretty quiet, uh, it was a pretty quiet turn. Uh, I don't know. Calm before the storm? Sure. I might have already named one that. You'll have to go back and double check. Or I can after the stream. But Calm Before the Storm works. Or Ship Spotted, sir. Given all these ships in the Java Sea. He knows we know they're there. Um, yeah, so uh, either one of those works. I don't think Ship Spotted, sir, is the best name. Calm Before the Storm. <laughs> A nice cup of, uh, cup of Java. Cup of Joe? I don't know. All right, so that's probably going to do it for this turn. I don't I don't have a lot else to show. By the way, where is the uh the Hornet? Oh, she's coming in. So the US uh USS Hornet, a new carrier just arrived in theater on her way to Pearl. Uh, obviously all the other carriers are way far away, but just trying to get her into Pearl. Um does she get an upgrade or an up update? Yeah, she has an upgrade in 4 days. So maybe since she's just going to be at Pearl, we'll just immediately give her the upgrade. Uh, that will give her some more anti-aircraft units. It'll give her some 20 millimeter Orlicons to replace the 50 caliber machine guns. So those will be much more effective anti-aircraft pieces. The 50 cals really aren't very good. The Orlicons are very good guns. Get even better once we get uh, some of those proximity fuses. Uh, looks like we add a few new 1.1 1 .1, uh, inch anti-aircraft guns. Are those the Chicago like telephone poles? I forget what they're called. Might be that. Um, and do they get new radar? No, radar's the same. Um, so, yeah, that's the situation there. Let's do one other thing here. Let's take a quick look at our pools. So, troops, industry, resource pools. Uh, nope, not that. That's not what I wanted. I didn't want to look at how many mines we have. I wanted to look at aircraft pools. Where the hell are those? Replacement pool. Here we go. So, if we take a look at that, let's hide the Soviets because they're, they're not involved at the moment. 
You can see here we have 47 Hell Divers in the U.S. Army Reserve, 42 Fulmers. Oh, great. All those aircraft suck. We do have 39 P-40E Warhawks. That's a very healthy stock there for when some attrition kicks in. Um, 38 A-24 Army Dive Bomber Banshees. Those are the, the Dauntless, but in the Army configuration. 38 Australian Whirlaways, which suck. 30 Dutch CW-22 Falcons. These are basically kind of light bomber recon type aircraft. Um, we've got 24 P-36 Mohawks, which are decent, I think. They kind of look like the P-40, um, P-47, but with a much weaker armament. Their problem is they're very maneuverable. Their fundamental problem is they have two machine guns, a 50 cal and a 30 cal, so they have no striking power. Uh, meanwhile, we've got 23 F-4 F-3 Wildcats, 23 P-400 Cobras. Um, and then we've got 21 PBY-5 Catalinas. That's a, those are Dutch Catalinas, but that's a good amount. Um, 20 Hudson 3s for the British. Uh, some Buffaloes. We've got 16 P-38 Lightnings, which we're not even producing yet. So we've got 16 reserves for that squadron of 27 in, the, in Burma. Uh, we've got 15 Canadian Kitty Hawk 1s, uh, 15 British Mohawk 4s. 15 British Albacore 1 biplane torpedo bombers, um, and 13 Dutch B-25 Mitchells. So that's actually a good, a good quantity of Dutch Mitchells there for us to use uh, as replacements in Java, should, should these air raids get beaten up a bit. So yeah, um, I think that's probably going to about do it, though, for this particular turn. I don't have... Don't think I have anything else to show. Anything else you guys want to see? I know we've only been going for about an hour, but usually these War in the Pacific streams aren't too long. I've got some other stuff going on, so I'm not going to extend the stream or anything like that. I don't have uh, don't have anything else to show you, and I'm not going to play anything else tonight. So this will end up being a little bit short, but I do hope you guys enjoyed. It, before we let you go, any other thoughts, questions, anything you want to see? Chaplain, I'm in the process of reworking my submarine force, so... I will let you guys know more in a few turns, but I don't yet know exactly what I'm going to be doing with my subs yet. They've been really ineffective thus far. Um, what do the French have on Tahiti? Not much. Uh, so we've, we've brought in some tankers in Tahiti uh, so that we can use it as a stopover point. Um, we have the Americal Division, by the way, just refueled at Tahiti, at least partially, and is, uh, is on its way to Australia still. So we've got this one really good American division is finally starting to get close. Well, sort of. <laughs> they're not too far away. Uh, but they're, they're starting to get in the vicinity of Australia. Uh, it would be tempting to take them around the coast of Australia and swing them into Burma, but I don't think they'd arrive in time. We also do have some other shipping on the way to Cape Town with a bunch of troops and aircraft. So if you see here, we've got uh, this group here, some uh, aviation, the 53rd Separate Infantry Regiment, some artillery, the 1st U.S. Marine Corps Air Wing. All of these guys are on the way to Cape Town. So once they arrive in Cape Town, there's a lot of places we could send them. But the real powerhouse here is the 53rd Separate Infantry Regiment. They've got like 100 and something U.S. rifle squads. They're light in equipment. They don't have like tanks and stuff like that. But they're a pretty decent unit um, once they get trained up and uh, well-equipped. So we can deploy them somewhere, maybe into Burma. The problem is their convoy is 20 days away. So once they get to Cape Town, they're 20 days from Cape Town. To go from Cape Town to Burma is probably another 10 to 15 days. So you're probably about a month away from them arriving. But there's also a good amount of aviation support there too. So we can throw those into India if the situation uh, goes from bad to worse. Meanwhile, we've also got the 70, 754th Tank Battalion here, which is another really good unit. Oh, wait, that's an infantry battalion. Uh, where is the tank battalion? The 754th Tank Battalion here. So these guys have, uh, what, like a total of 59 Stuart tanks on them. So that's another nice striking force that we could put into, uh, into India or into Sri Lanka as needed or uh, send them to Burma if the opportunity still exists. So that's another very good unit that we have on the way. There are 10 days um, away from Cape Town. So these guys are much closer so a nice tank battalion there. There's an infantry battalion here. It's a small-ish unit, but uh, 30 U.S. infantry squads can can definitely be in, be useful. Um, and then we've got a pursuit group. So we've got 25 P-39 Aerocobras, which can come in that way, and then the 110th Combat Engineer Battalion. 
Not 100% sure where we send these guys. We could send them to like reinforce some of these islands at, like Coast Coast. I really want to hold Coast Coast. I think it's really important because if he gets bombers there, that's going to fuck anything up with bringing supplies down from Cape Town, down from Colombo uh, or India. That's going to really ravage our ability to effectively have Australia and, uh, and Sri Lanka be in communication with each other. So I could send them there or I could send them to Burma again, depending on the situation there. But those guys are, are among the closest uh, around. We also have some more air groups here, a bunch of air groups actually on the way to Cape Town that could either go into Western Australia or into Burma. The reason I sent these guys, it's a longer route to go around the, the Cape. The reason I sent them there is twofold. One, it's a much longer route to Australia to go this way, but the Japanese carriers were sort of venturing forth as if they were going to interdict our shipping to Australia, so I didn't want to risk getting these guys sunk at sea. Because you can see, like, there's a huge amount of really good aircraft here, like 100-plus modern fighters on this on this group, as well as some B-26 bombers and some Banshees. But the reason I sent them there is twofold. One, I didn't want to risk them getting sunk by Japanese carriers that might have been on a raid between the U.S. and Australia. Two, I wanted to give myself more flexibility. So I lost some time, but I gained some flexibility because by sending them here, I can either send them directly to the Indian Theater or I can send them to the west coast of Australia. So by the time, if I had committed them to Australia... I would have kind of committed them to the longer route to Burma in the event that I changed my mind. This gave me more flexibility at the cost of some time. So these guys were going to arrive in Cape Town in 19 days. Uh, and so there's there's that. Um, American air units in Burma will, will withdraw in 642. Uh, well, only the American air units that are presently there, Co. So this, this, this formation here... These guys, none of these guys are going to withdraw in June. Like these, these units don't withdraw ever. So if we do bring these guys in, that's like another 125 fresh fighters and bombers and stuff like that for us to, to bring in here. We've got one, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven fighter squadrons and two bomber squadrons. So that's like 100 and, 170 aircraft or so. So we could definitely bring those into uh, into India. That was the other intention, Co. is that they would be able to arrive in Burma at the time that my current crack planes are going to have to start withdrawing. So that should be nice. Um, and then we've got another squadron down here, another group down here, a transport group, uh, Marine Raider Battalion, uh, Wake Force Defense Battalion, and another Marine Defense Battalion. So about 60 or so assault value on these guys. They could go to defending some of the small islands like Diego Garcia or Adu in the event that the Japanese try and cut off Colombo from South Africa, which I feel like is a viable, viable option for them. Also, the 3rd 102nd Infantry uh, Battalion. I'm actually bringing the the entire 102nd Separate Infantry Regiment, uh, which is about 120 or so assault value, are is is deployed in this. Well, two of them are deployed on transports on the way to Burma, and then we could bring the third one from Christchurch in in New Zealand uh, up that way as well. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. That's kind of all I got to show. We've got another air group down here, just one pursuit group. On the way, they're 16 days away from Colombo. Um, and then actually we've got two bomber squadrons and a pursuit group here. Um, I don't know why I sent a headquarters unit there. It's a small fighter group. But uh, two bomber groups of uh, marauders that could also be used uh, in theater too. No flights from Java. What do you mean? I mean, he didn't uh, he didn't bomb Java this turn, and I didn't uh, I didn't fly my fighters this turn. So both sides sort of licked their wounds in Java this last turn after the heavy dogfight the turn before. I kind of would expect him to start launching massive air attacks on Batavia with with the Kitty Butai next turn. So I'm I'm thinking that maybe it just makes sense uh, to try and get our our bombers off off the island and attack them. We'll see. I'll think about that. I'm not going to send the turn off quite yet, so I'm going to do a bunch more orders between now and probably late tomorrow when I would imagine I'd send it. I do think we're going to shock attack at Batan, so I think that's sort of the one big call out is I do plan to shock attack at Batan, and then we'll see what we what we decide to do in the Java Sea. I need to think about that a little bit more. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up right here. Hope you guys enjoyed yet another episode of War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition. Uh, in this series, now under new management, with our a new opponent being 
Lieutenant Rainbow Slash. A link is in the description in the channel to his channel if you do want to go ahead and check it out. As always, I would ask if you are going to watch both sides of the gameplay, do not leave comments on either of our videos as you may unwittingly uh, give intelligence to one side or the other. With that being said, hope you guys did enjoy the video. Let me know your thoughts on the appending attack on Batan. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's a trap? If they are moving, we could catch him in movement formation, which could be great. But he could also be like had ordered him to move and then ordered him to stop to like trick me or something. But, you know, there's only one way to find out. And that's to launch a headlong bayonet charge into waiting enemy rifles and see how it plays out. But as I've said, that's going to do it for today's episode. Uh, I appreciate the support. Hope you guys are having a great start to, new, to your new year. And as always, this is the Historical Gamer saying, until next time, I'm out.